production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High. Learn the stories behind two Pulitzer Prize winning images captured from two different 20th century wars. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Quickle. The Korean War was a war against communism that began and ended within three years, but it didn't get much media attention here in the United States, other than being the setting for MASH, and so it's often referred to as the Forgotten War. Associated press photographer Max Desfour was there to capture it all, and his images are currently on view at the Ohio History Center. Here's more. So the Korean War is known in the history books as the Forgotten War, and it's largely because it's sort of sandwiched smack dab in between the Good War and the Bad War. 38,000 American lives were lost in a three-year struggle of, of, of really epic proportions in terms of brutality and casualties took place. So this is sobbing orphans of war, and this is a great reminder of the impact of the war on the civilians of Korea. We estimate, and these are, are very rough estimates, but we estimate that about three million civilians are killed in the fight in the Korean War. Sometimes I see the number as high as, as four million. Um, that's about 10% of the Korean population, which was about 30 million at the start of the war. So think about that. 10% of the, of the civilian population killed during the war. So this is new enemy faces in Korea. And I think in the entire display, it's the only photograph that has the Chinese picture. Now, the Chinese played a prominent part in the war. They intervened in late 1950 to support their North Korean allies and drove the United States forces all the way back below the 38th parallel. In late 1950, when the Chinese communists entered the war and they blunted the American offensive and were driving them back to South Korea, a group of American soldiers were trapped in the North. They fought their way through and then to try to escape uh, the Chinese and the North Korean offensive, which had them surrounded, they headed for a port city in North Korea called Hongnam. Along the way, word spread that the American military was planning an evacuation of these soldiers. So North Korean civilians, also trying to escape from the Chinese Communist Offensive, all started heading to Hongnam. In the end, about 100,000 American soldiers and 100,000 North Korean refugees descended on this small port city right around Christmas 1950. And in what they called Operation Christmas Cargo, or we would sometimes call it the Christmas Miracle, the American Navy, which at this point was pretty small in the area, and so it was largely merchant marine ships, came in and rescued all 200,000 of these people and took them down south where they would be safe. And what was really the most amazing part of this is one ship, one of the last ships, called the SS Meredith Victory. The SS Meredith Victory was configured to hold about 60 people. There were still 14,000 refugees left waiting for safe transport. So the captain, acting on his own authority, completely stripped his ship bare. They threw supplies, they threw weapons, they threw everything over the side to make room. And they crammed, unbelievably, all 14,000 people onto the ship that was designed to carry 60. And for three days, the ship steamed south. It was so cramped that nobody could move. You couldn't lie down or sit down. It was completely shoulder to shoulder. And yet, all 14,000 survived. In fact, not only did they all survive, but five children were born on the three-day trip. This is the Taedong River Bridge photo. Um, and it's taken in December 1950, and it won the Pulitzer Prize in 1951. Uh, Desfour actually didn't think this was his best photo from the war, but he was happy, obviously, that it won. The photo was taken in December 1950 when the Chinese Communist forces are pouring towards Pyongyang and driving American forces back, and everybody is evacuating across the Taedong River just south of Pyongyang, trying to escape the oncoming communists. So Desfour is on the southern shore taking these photos, but they're desperately trying to flee south to avoid the Chinese communists themselves. And I remember Desfour commenting how the most striking thing from the photo was the silence, how no one said a word as they were desperately trying to carry all of their possessions and make it across the bridge um, and avoid the um, violence that was coming. 
So this is reaching up from a snowy grave, and it may be the most famous photo from the war, uh, even more so than the one that Desfor won the Pulitzer Prize for. And you can see why. It's this incredibly powerful image of someone who had been killed and was struggling to get out um, with his hands here and, and a mouth where he was trying to breathe. What Desfor didn't know was that when the Marines went through and, and dug up the area, they found a mass grave of about 100 uh, women, men, women, and children who'd been shot, hands tied together, and then buried, and the snow just fell on top of them while they struggled for those last breaths of air. So the impact of the war on the civilian population is something that these photographs remind us we can never forget. The Forgotten War, Korea 1950, is on view at the Ohio History Center through April 2nd. Visit ohiohistory.org to learn more. After World War I, the U.S. Navy thought rigid, blimp-like airships would be a useful tool to scout out enemy positions in the sea. The USS Shenandoah was the first of its kind. It was inflated with helium and then it traveled across the U.S. on a goodwill publicity tour. But in September of 1925, as the airship was traveling over Ohio, a violent storm sent it crashing to the ground. I got the chance to pop by the Ohio History Center where they have some debris that was collected from the crash site. Okay, Cliff, tell me what we're looking at. It looks like a fragment of something. Yeah, these are fragments from the USS Shenandoah, which was the first rigid airship built in the United States in 1923 and she served in the United States Navy. So at this time, what was the purpose of an airship? Was it for transportation, for entertainment? Why were they around, especially with airplanes on the rise? Well, the Shenandoah was built for the United States Navy, and the idea behind the airships was that it was supposed to provide reconnaissance for the fleet and help find the enemy and uh, provide the fleet with information. And in 1925, in September, she was sent on a publicity tour, and she was going to tour uh, some of the state fairs and other county fairs in the Midwest. Early on the morning of September 3rd, uh, when they were flying over eastern Ohio, they hit a severe storm squall, which caused the aircraft to break apart. And uh, the control gondola, where the captain and seven crew members, it was stripped away from the aircraft, and they crashed. And, uh, none of them survived. It had a crew, normally a crew of 41, there were 43 aboard when she crashed. Uh, 14 died during the crash, but 29 survived because the uh, three sections that still contained it, some of the uh, helium gas bags uh, came down fairly gently. Well, this is part of the framework that uh, uh, provided the structure, the rigid structure, to uh, the dirigible. Uh, the framework is made of duralumin, which is made of aluminum, uh, copper, and magnesium. And, uh, but you can see, uh, shows the, right. the damage where, where it was ripped apart. Is it really heavy or light, or how did they? It's very lightweight. Is it? Can I pick it up? Sure. Oh my gosh, it's extremely light. And this is uh, something from the interior of the ship. These were from one of the gla gas bladders that held the helium that provided buoyancy okay. to the airship and uh, it was made from the intestines of cattle, but at the time it was the most impermeable material they knew how to make so that would keep the gas in. And this is a paper cup from the crash site. Huh, look at that. Uh, the crash site is in uh, uh, Noble County, not too far from uh, Caldwell. Okay. And uh, the crash site of the largest section is right near I-77 and you uh, can see the crash site from the freeway and it's marked with uh, cement blocks. Earlier in our program, we showed you photographs of the Korean War. Now here's the work of another Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, one who captured scenes from a different war, Vietnam. Eddie Adams won a Pulitzer for the famous 
I got an execution picture where the general is executing a Viet Cong. And he didn't like that picture. Loan, the, the police chief in, F, in essence, he just took a pistol out of his belt and walked up to him and bang, shot him just like that. And he felt this picture didn't tell the whole story. Loan's aide had been assassinated. His aide's wife had been assassinated. And four of their children had been assassinated by a Viet Cong assassination squad. And this guy in the picture was a captain in, uh, of an assassination squad. And he was a, in every way a spy. He wore civilian clothes. He was not a military. So Eddie felt that Loan got a bum rap. Eddie worked for the AP for a number of years. I think he went to the AP in the early 60s. And um, I don't think he ever set out to be a war photographer. Eddie grew up in New Kensington, Pennsylvania, which is about uh, half an hour outside of Pittsburgh. He was working for the newspaper when he was in high school. And then he went to the Marines when he was 17 years old. The Marines went to Vietnam in 1965. And that's Eddie followed the Marines over there. You know, the guys trusted him. He was one of them. He was a Marine. But being a Marine really informed the rest of his life. Well, Eddie passed away in 2004, and he had never gone through his work himself. And so when he, when he passed away, there was all this body of work, and the first chunk that I thought I would work on is the Vietnam work. And so the idea was to do a book. And so I worked with Hal Buell, who was his former boss at the AP, and these pictures come from, um, from the book. Photography, journalistic photography, was on the edge of a change. It was becoming much more repertorial and, and not so titillating, but more informative. And uh, Eddie just fit that. Which pictures do I find the most uh, revealing of the war? One is a picture shot from inside of a helicopter looking out and a woman is reaching up appealing to be taken aboard the helicopter. And there's absolutely no room on the helicopter. She had her wounded husband with her and Eddie made the picture and the helicopter just took off and left her behind and that really affected Eddie. When you know the story, it's a woman begging to be, to be freed from whatever was going to happen next. And then there's another similar picture where in the foreground there's a Vietnamese woman carrying her child and her GI is running this way. There's a firefight going on. And in both cases, what I liked about the pictures was that it showed how close the war was to the civilian population of Vietnam and the people. There's a, another story that came later that he wanted to be known for, uh, that he was actually more proud of, and that was um, the pictures he did on the boat people. He was very favorable towards the boat people picture, not because of the photography, but because the pictures had an impact on a political situation which involved the uh, opening up the gates to Vietnamese immigration, and it was one of the contributing factors that finally Oh, uh, increased the number of Vietnamese who could be and could immigrate to the U.S. In fact, Eddie resented being called a combat photographer, a war photographer, because his work was not just Vietnam. That's two years of a 50-year career. He did all other kinds of photography. One artist is helping veterans share their experiences of war while simultaneously contributing to their recovery through the power of art. By shredding their military uniforms, these men and women are able to tell their stories on combat paper. I had a tough time after my first deployment. I was in the National Guard. I was a truck driver. Uh, my first tour, 2004, 2005, I drove trucks. I came home. I had a lot of problems adjusting. I volunteered for my second deployment because I could not adjust to being home. I, I felt more comfortable going back to Iraq and being away from my family, my wife and my daughter. I felt more comfortable in Iraq than I felt here. So I volunteered to go back. And when I got there, I realized, wow, this was sort of a silly reason to volunteer to go to Iraq. And I'm just going to come home with the same sort of problems unless I figure out what it is that's going to keep me from continuously volunteering to come back to Iraq. So I started journaling. and. Uh, writing and developing an appreciation for narrative and if, if nothing else from my experiences I have a story I have a narrative and that's unique to the military experience as a whole that's unique from the army like my story is my story and 
my story, the story of my fellow veterans, the people to my left and right, um, isn't always represented in the big story. I picked up photography and from there I picked up some minor videography and, and uh, skills. Um, I went back to school for journalism. While I was in school for journalism, um, I managed to get my university to host a uh, peace paper workshop. Um, and the peace paper was sort of one of those branches from combat paper involving some of the same people. Um, and they taught me to make paper. And uh, um, all these things all relate back to for me, that narrative. The more tools that people have in their toolbox to share their story, to express themselves, the less alone they're gonna feel. So that's sort of how all this ties back into my military experience and, and my doorway into to the arts and, and, and all these other things. It's all about sharing your experiences and, and, and helping other people share their experiences. We wanted to bring it to Chillicothe because Chillicothe has a real history of paper making. You know, we had the Mead Company here for years. We ha still have Gladfelter here. They're both into paper making. And Dard Hunter's studio is here, and his family was always into paper making. And then we have a very large VA facility here, a lot of veterans. Uh, so we just thought this would be the perfect place to have it. I found out about it because I saw the movie Poster Girl on HBO, a documentary, and they showed her making the combat paper, working with those people, and how it helped her in healing. So when I saw that the show was in Yellow Springs, I wanted to go see it. And that when I went to see it, I was just blown away. It was like the most powerful show I'd ever seen. And it was just, it was very emotional, and it's almost like um, going to the Holocaust Museum. You know, it's just filled with emotion. And I thought, you know, we've got to bring this to Chillicothe and let people here see this. There's a couple points of intersection between this workshop um, and some of the other things going on at Pump House right now. Um, I'm not combat paper specifically, but I know combat paper people, and I wouldn't be doing what I would, what I do if not for. Drew Cameron, Drew Matat, and Jesse Albright, and all the other people in that show, uh, Chris Arendt. I mean, I think we all have sort of similar journeys uh, in trying to come home. <laughs> and um, we have we have some we share some steps in that. Veterans come and they take their uniforms and they cut them up into strips of paper and they make pulp and they make paper and then make art out of it. And um, a lot of this is a really a healing process, which is why we call it Journey to Normal. And uh, there's a lot of emotion and a lot of feelings in the pieces. For me as a paper maker, it's a huge honor to be in Chillicothe because the history, the lineage of paper making in Chillicothe is Anybody, who's, anybody who considers themselves a paper maker and has read anything about the history of paper making knows about Dart Hunter and that this is where hand paper making was sort of preserved as industrial paper making took over. So it's an honor to be in this space with Dart Hunter and Pump House. So you're cutting up uniforms. Are you, are you angry about your service? Are you upset about your service? Or what's what's like? It's it's not destroying a uniform. It's transforming a uniform, and further, I think it's transforming a symbol. Um, and for me, I mean, I think it's a lot of different things for a lot of different people at a lot of different times. Sometimes it is angry thing and more power to that because those people need to work through those anger issues like they need to work through that they need to get past that uh, for some people it's commemorative some people have printed uh, I've worked with people who print you know pictures of them with their guns having a great time or their their company photo um, and and or they'll print their rank and insignia and all the awards that they won and they put that on the wall you know and 
on the wall, there, there are tell stories that their uniforms would not tell if they were in a box in the attic or, or in the garage or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's not destroying the uniforms, it's transforming them. And, and I think it's furthermore, it's transforming a symbol and taking, for me personally, that um, the uniform represents a story. To anybody who hasn't worn the, the uniform, the uniform represents a story, a cookie cut sort of box. This is what my veterans are. This is what my military service members do. This is my preconception about what they have. And it's breaking down that big story and allowing you to transform it into a story that more accurately represents your individual service. Whether it's good or bad, whether you're angry or loved it, that's not, that's not what the workshop's about. The workshop's about helping you, giving you the tools to tell your own story. Our final story tonight demonstrates how art is helping children understand a dark time in our history. This project honors the children who died in the Holocaust with artfully crafted butterflies. Butterflies really embody transformation and transcendence. Through this project, you feel that. The poem by Pavel Friedman called The Butterfly inspired us to create a lesson plan that we took to schools starting here in the Houston area and then eventually worldwide that gave the kids an opportunity to identify with the loss of 1.5 million children that perished during the Holocaust. Kids were asked to draw butterflies, create some sort of butterfly that they could commemorate to a child lost in the Holocaust. And they would hang these delicate, fragile, beautiful butterflies and they'd hang them from their classroom ceilings. Kids would come into their classroom, it was beautiful, it was wonderful, it was delicate, it was just as, as amazing as any butterfly would be. And the teacher would come in one day and she would randomly cut down their butterfly. And this, you can imagine, made children upset, saddened, angry. Why'd you cut down my butterfly? Well, the truth is, there was no reason. There was no reason the children of the Holocaust perished as well. So that lesson connected the kids of today to the children of the Holocaust. My mother was a Holocaust survivor. About 11 years ago, when the Holocaust Museum Houston was celebrating its 10th anniversary, I interviewed my mother for the project. I was looking through photos of hers, old photos, and I found for the very first time a picture of her little sister, and she was in a butterfly costume. She perished upon arrival in Auschwitz. That has been chilling to me ever since. My father was a survivor to me like no other. For me as his daughter, to watch how someone can overcome so much and, and, and still be hopeful about the world that we live in, um, I was always in awe of that. These butterflies came to us from all over the world. Um, with the exception of one continent, Antarctica, we received them from everywhere. We created an exhibit in our museum um, for people to see, and we started a, a traveling exhibit, which many Houstonians can now see here in Houston uh, at Two Allen Center. We have a wonderful exhibit that's going to be here for three months. Butterflies are made of all media, wire, fabric, glass, metal, paper origami, crochet, needlepoint. Needle point. There also are fragments of poems, the poems that were written in Theresienstadt on some of these butterflies, as well as some of the names of the children who perished 
at this time. Each one speaks to you differently. Some are funny, some are sweet, and some just tug at your heartstrings. There's six exhibits that'll be traveling throughout the community, and just seeing one isn't enough. You really want to see all the different cases. In just a short few years, we won't have any Holocaust survivors that can actually go into the schools, go out into the community and talk about their experiences. And so it's up to us, second generation, third generation, to carry on their message of hope. If we leave no other message than hope for tomorrow through this project, then, then we've won. Butterfly Project can go on and on and it will continue to resonate with children of tomorrow as well. That's our show. You can see all of today's stories at WOSU.org and be sure to check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Columbus musician Drake Talbot released his latest album, Old Soul, last summer. And that's who we're closing out the show with today. Thanks for watching. Join us back here next week for more great stories on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.